Now, in our first story, the newly created Savannah region has been in the news this year for at least two cases of violence against women. As the country heads to the polls, there are growing concerns about insecurity as armed robbery and political violence emerge. For our series dubbed Safety for My Boats, which puts the spotlight on security in hotspot communities, we take a stop in the region with 129 hotspots. Correspondent Isaac Nonyas report read to you. Until it was carved out of the then northern region, the Savannah region has been considered one of the most peaceful areas with minimal security breaches. These mostly bordered in chieftaincy disputes. As elections draw closer, 129 hotspots have been identified by the police. With this in mind, one of the topmost security concerns for residents here in Damango, in the West Gonja municipality of the Savannah region, increasing armed robberies. It is very rampant, very common, almost day in, day out. We hear cases about armed robbery cases. And violence against women in the region. In terms of security bridges, you talk about these alleged witchcraft issues. The poor, vulnerable women, they are those that these issues are always, uh, they always suffer from these accusations. Areas like Damango Fofoso Road, Sola Damango Highway, Bamboy, Bole and Sola Highway, including Bupe and Fofoso Highway, have all become dangerous to ply, as robberies are often recorded there. Residents say they are terrified. For other residents, youthful indiscipline is on the rise. And it appears the political fever is making most of them feel comfortable in their zones, in the sense that the politicians sometimes visit them, encourage them, and even assist them. And I am feeling that they have the potential of escalating our insecurity in the community. Here is Savannah Regional Chairman of People Living with Disabilities, Kitley Stephen. He says the political intolerance exhibited between supporters of the NPP and NDC during the registration exercise should not have gone unpunished. It was not fine, it was not good for Damango because gunshots here and there. Some of them got injured. Some of these people, those who had the guns, were brought to Damango. They were arrested and brought to Damango. As I talk, I don't know how it has ended. Meanwhile, the pains of the lynching of 90 year Madame Ekwia Dente of Kafaba in the East Gonja district and that of Maria Abukari and two others at Sumpini in the West Gonja municipality in the region are still fresh in the minds of many. Meanwhile, Public Relations Officer of the Savannah Regional Police Command, Ejekum Ousu, says although the concerns are legitimate, police there have the situation under control. Having three topmost bridges, breaches, I should say, in the region which were very dear to we, the police. One being the chieftaincy issue which was at uh, Bali. With the help of the Security Council and the uh, Yagbangura, we've been able to solve that problem. As I'm talking to you, a substantive, a substantive chief has been enskinned at the place and now there is peace. The second one was robbery on our highways and especially during market days in certain villages and towns. With the introduction of on the vehicle escort by the regional command, problem to has been curtailed and uh, at the moment robbery on our highways has drastically reduced, if not eradicated. It has come down uh, to the barest minimum, which is good. 
Now, Senior Program Officer of the National Commission on Small Arms and Light Weapons, Leonard Tete, has urged the National Peace Council and other peace brokers to immediately move to the Banda constituency in order to avert possible electoral violence during the election. According to him, the issues surrounding the recent voter registration disturbance that resulted in the death of the 28-year-old Silas Woloshame is lingering and likely to spark community violence if the situation is not urgently dealt with. Leonard was speaking to Joy News' Nesta Kafuya Juma at Banda Hinko when the commission took its ballots without bullets to the constituency. The Ballots Without Bullet campaign by the Small Arms Commission seeks to influence citizens to uphold peace ahead of Ghana's elections on December 7. Leonard Titi emphasized the need for finding a common ground to resolve the violence that erupted between the NPP and NDC during the voters' registration exercise in the Banda constituency. We are a bit concerned about issues here in Banda. There are still underlying issues that we think as a commission needs to be addressed seriously. We are therefore calling on all stakeholders to, as a matter of urgency, uh, 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 bring attention to Banda. This seems to be a very critical area, and as a commission, we are very worried about it. And we are ready to share the various uh, 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 messages that we had, the various uh, issues that we picked up to, with anyone who is interested so that we make sure Banda doesn't erupt. But from the indications we are having, we are not very satisfied with the issues here at, at Banda. Uh, let's go into this election to elect our leaders. We should go in in a peaceful manner and we should do it in a very peaceful manner. We shouldn't resort to the use of guns. Meanwhile, MPP's parliamentary candidate for the Banda constituency, Joe Dankwa, who is contesting NDC's Ahmed Ibrahim, the current MP for the area, have pledged their total commitment to ensure violent free election on December 7. From the registration, we saw that things did not go well in the district. And we saw that the name of the district or the constituency was all over. So we decided from our end to resolve issues and also make sure that what happened during the registration will not happen again in Banahe. We are praying that we will sustain uh, the peace that we are going to be before, during, and after the elections. I therefore want to use this opportunity to pledge my support to the National Peace Council and the Small Arms Commission, and also to pledge that whatever the outcome of the December 7th elections, I will stand by it. And I know that just as we've been doing, we in the National Democratic Congress, from the presidency to myself as a member of parliament or as a parliamentary candidate, we will go by the declaration of the Electoral Commission and will go for peace. We will never take arms. We will never take cordials. We will never engage vigilantes to cause mayhem on our political opponent, for we are the state, and the state is us. Now, five of the victims of Saturday's road accident involving NDC supporters at Ijua in the Ashanti region have been transferred to the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. Authorities at the Ijua Government Hospital say the five with head injuries are part of 54 who sustained in various degrees of injury in the road crash. The NDC supporters were traveling to join a political rally at Idra when the bus conveying them was crossed by a motorcycle. The driver lost control of the wheels leading to the accident. Six persons died in the accident at Frante in the Idra Setredumase municipality. Dr. Mensa Manye is the medical superintendent 
at the Ejua Government Hospital. He joins us on the phone. Dr. Menta, what are the conditions of the injured now? Dr. Menta, can you hear me? Right, um, Dr. Menta Mange is medical superintendent of the Ejua Government Hospital from where six persons have been transferred to the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. We will be speaking to him shortly to understand the condition of those who are currently under treatment because we understand a total of 54 persons were injured from this accident and six of them died, unfortunately. So Dr. Mange is with us currently. Doc, um, tell us what I are the table. conditions of these injured persons. We had a persons. total of 54 after accident victims who came in with various forms of uh, various degree of uh, injury. We have five uh, who had a severe head injury and also five also had multiple fractures of uh, both the, the left and the arm. That is the femur and the uh, humerus. Yes, by God, we've been able to resuscitate all the accident victims, all those who were involved in it. And those with the head injury and multiple fractures also, we resuscitated them, those who need blood transfusion also had blood transfused. Uh, we didn't be necessary to refer those with head, severe head injury cases. Yesterday morning, that was uh, Sunday morning, to Kofanochi. Five of them went to Kofanochi and also five went went to orthopedic unit at Biaya Okonta due to the congestion at the Kofanochi unit. But the majority of the cases were discharged after resuscitation and proper treatment. Currently I have only about four cases with me here. Hopefully they will also be discharged by tomorrow. But all the rest are discharged home yesterday. Mm. All the rest of those who recovered fully were discharged home yesterday. Right. Now, Doc, Nothing we about. understand that me? some five persons have been transferred to the Confanochi Teaching Hospital. How critical are their conditions? If I, your voice, I can hardly hear you, please. I was asking about those transferred to Confanochi Teaching Hospital. I wanted to know how critical their condition is. Yeah, those transferred are also recovering very well. Currently, they are all stable. And even those transferred to BI or Conta are also, well, they are all stable, responding to treatment. So far, no other death has been recorded. Except those at, uh, uh, that happened at the accident scene, which were the six. Cases. Thank you very now, much, Dr. Mensa Mange, for, mm, for joining us. Now, still on the NDC, presidential candidate John Romani Mahama says, despite a corruption tag put around the neck of his government by then opposition New Patriotic Party, the governing party is now swimming in corruption. Speaking at an evening community engagement in the Bogatanga East constituency, he cited the Ejapa and PDS deals as justification for his claims. Maxwell Agbagba has a rap from the former president's campaigns. An Asawasi constituency held walk in memory of party founder and former president Jerry John Rawlins was the last activity that ended NDC presidential candidate John Mohamed's tour of the Shanti region. His message, especially in some mining communities, focused on freeing persons jailed for Galamse as part of mining sector reform. He said the NDC will improve the free senior high school program but will abolish the double track system within a year and rather focus on building more schools. In farming communities, he has been promising farmers free fertilizers. John Mahama has also been touting the infrastructural record of the party in the Shanti region, citing the Kedetia market and others, stating the NDC will do more if elected. 
Corruption featured prominently during his visit to communities over the weekend. At Mampon, he told electorates the NDC will act on the findings of the special prosecutor on the Japa deal if persons who illegally benefited from it do not return the money if NDC wins. We are moving to the Upper East region right now so ahead of me you can see the convoy um, moving we were in the Ashanti region earlier um, today where there was a walk organized by the NDC in the Asawasi um, constituency what we've noticed is that as you begin to move from the greater Accra region the compliance, the wearing of the face marks really begins to um, diminish. In the Ashanti region where we were, um, I took particular notice um, of that, that in the Ashanti region not many people um, were wearing their face marks. And as we continue to move in um, further to the northern part of the country, um, to the Savannah region, to the northern region, and now to the upper east region, not many people you know, um, are wearing the masks. And that, is actually having a trickling effect actually at those community engagements where the NDC presidential candidate has been speaking. So for many of the places that we visited, um, the members of the campaign team, those who are with the convoy, those who are with the campaign team, you see all of them wearing their face marks. The only time you see them taking off their face marks is when they are coming to interact you know, um, with the people who are gathered. That's the only time you see them remove it. And even when they are about to speak, um, the microphones are sanitized before they talk. But quite disappointingly though, the people who come to listen to the message that they have for them really are not adhering to the COVID-19 protocols. Part of his speech focused on corruption in the Borga East constituency Sunday evening. All you see is corruption. At the time we were in office, they tarred us with the brush of corruption. And they made so much noise about it. Today, the president is baffing in corruption. And I say that because the allegations of corruption are of people close to him. And that's why I say he's baffing in it. You can be president, there might be a CEO or something who does something. You probably are not aware. But when you become aware, you must take action against it. Now, the government MPP is hopeful its quest to win 1 million votes and 30 out of the 33 seats in the eastern region is on course. President Ekufuado, who expressed optimism, says his good work across the country would result in an emphatic win for him in the December 7 general elections, just two weeks away. At the start of day two of the eastern regional tour at Ebri, Nane Ekufuado said the NPP has the blueprint for Ghana's development Hence the need for it to be retained in government for another term. Let me make this idea that we need to move in. We are trying to make our community more sorry. We are trying to make our community boom, 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 boom. We are trying to make our community more sorry. We are trying to make our community more sorry. We are trying to make our community more sorry. We are trying to make our community more beautiful woman Oh, I dream be so. I want to be the deputy minister of finance. Oh, boy, you my papa, papa. The best time, former of an anano, and your former of a bna or say asari. Now, the president's advisor on health, Dr. Anthony Ziasari 
has hinted that Ghana's health sector would see a robust infrastructural development under the next new patriotic party administration. He indicated that the ecofadu led government would construct about 113 ultra-modern health facilities across the country, complete the digitization of the health system, and expand health training facilities to enhance human resources in the sector. He emphasized that the delivery of these promises, um, coupled with other interventions, would enhance quality healthcare delivery to warrant a healthy nation. Dr. Nsiasari was speaking at the Volta NPP Nurses and Midwives Network Conference 2020 in Ho. I'm building 101 district hospitals. And these are district hospitals, which are district hospitals of emergency center, of what it takes to be a district hospital, S3 and everything is in. We are also putting up seven regional hospitals, between 170 to 200 bed regional hospitals. They are all the six new regions who get regional hospitals with all the necessary machinery and equipment inside the regional hospitals, including MRI and CT scans. We are also putting two psychiatric hospitals, one in the middle bed in Kumasi, another one also in, um, in, in Tamani, and rehabilitate the Pantan Psychiatric Hospitals. We are also going to put another three infectious diseases centers. Of, in collaboration with the private sector. Now we finish the uh, Accra one, there will be one in Kumasi, there will be one in Tamale, and one in Takrade. And this is the beginning of having what you call Center for Disease Control for Ghana. Now we're just about two weeks to the December 7 elections. Inmates of the Sawan Medium Security Prison have a special message for Ghanaians. They say the prisons are already full, so nobody should engage in any acts that could lead to their incarceration and worsen their plight. Seth Kwame Boating has been spending time with the inmates in Nsawam and has come through with this report. <laughs> Prisons across the country are full. They are very full. The current prison population is 13,333. These are gains a holding capacity of 9,500. The Insawam Medium Security Prison, where I am today, was built to accommodate 817 inmates. But presently, there are about 3,000 inmates in this facility. The number was at some point more than 3,500. The serious congestion across all prison facilities in Ghana coupled with the inhumane conditions there make managing the prisons very difficult. Overcrowding, we all know, is an impediment to our activities in prisons. Our core function of ensuring uh, safe custody and welfare of the inmates becomes very difficult when we have overcrowding in our prisons. Over the years, election-related crimes like ballot box snatching, double voting and impersonation got many arrested with some having to serve various jail terms. The inmates here say this should not repeat in this year's election since the facilities are overstretched and any addition to their overpopulated numbers will further deepen their plight. But this is not a place to be at all. It's not a place to be. And that is why we're urging all Ghanaians, especially the youth, I want to emphasize on the youth, not to allow themselves to be manipulated, to engage in any violent activity which would end them in here. We want to come out there. So we don't want people to come and add up to it. You know. So we expect that we conduct ourselves in a manner that will be devoid of any violence, that will be devoid of any more practices, such that we go through the election peacefully. <laughs> You go and commit such a crime, and you are, I mean, you've been prosecuted and sent to prison. You will be the loser. You being the loser didn't end there. You have imprisoned the entire family and imprisoned the country as a whole. Because your dependents will now no longer become, become orphans. Your immediate children become orphans. Who is to take care of them? You, nobody can take care of your children more than you do. You can take good care of your children. So please, I will entreat each and every youth 
of today that nobody should allow himself to be influenced by any political uh, party or individual. This year too, the Inmate Choir has produced this beautiful rendition to promote peace ahead of the elections. With our security agencies ready for the elections and have promised not to spare anyone engaged in any form of electoral violence and other electoral related crimes. Be extra careful so you don't end up in the prison. This is Seth Kwame Boateng for Joy News. Beautiful song there by inmates of the Insawum prison. Away from that, though, educationist and chairman of the National Development Planning Commission, Professor Stephen Adair, is cautioning both political parties against any plans to scrap the double track system in senior high schools. He says the system ensures safety in times of COVID-19 pandemic and gives students the needed instructional hours which resulted in the improved WASI results this year. Speaking in a yet-to-be-aired episode of On the Record on Joy Prime TV, Prof. Adair said he would implement it in his private senior high school. Them are saying they are going to abolish double track. No, it must be permanent for some time, for about two to three years, because we cannot concentrate the students too much. In Ghana Christian International School, we are going double irrespective of what the government says, because I won't like to risk my children. Even if you build the schools, uh, yes, dormitories and other things, they'll still be too crowded. And the third is that properly done, the contact hours are still the same. And the results of WASI have shown that even double track people did better than the previous years. Now, Prof. Adair is also of the view that the current administration is in the lead as far as the 2020 elections are concerned. I think things are loaded in favor of NPP. Why? A few things. First of all, you know, when Rawlings Cross created Western, Upper West, they voted almost 100% for NDC for almost 20 years. Okufuado has created six new regions. I think that it will impact the elections. I believe that Ghanaians are going to vote on the basis of about three things. One is education. I think the dice is in favor of NPP. They are going to vote on roads. The NPP has not done worse than NDC. So what I'm saying depends upon which, where you live. Therefore, it's not going to be too much in favor. Let me now, of course, the full interview with Professor Stephen Adair airs on the Joy Prime channel tonight at 8 p.m., the program on the record. Now, later this evening on this channel, we bring you the story of greatness. We tell you the phenomenal, sustained, and impactful life of the National Chief Imam of Ghana, Sheikh Osman Nuhu Sharubutu. Ahead of the screening of the film put together by my colleague Latif Idris, we bring you a precursor. Sheikh Osman Nuhu Sharabutu. His greatest triumph lies in his legacy as a peace building champion, a leader, a philanthropist, a humanitarian, and a teacher. That legacy stretches beyond the boundaries of Ghana 
to neighboring countries like Nigeria, Senegal, and Morocco, where he has publicly taken his teachings of the religion of Islam and the campaign for religious tolerance too. I haven't seen him use a, a, a earpiece to enable him here. I see he's got all his teeth. I see him not using glasses like I'm using glasses now. He would stand up and in his own soft, quiet way be moving. But how did this beautiful, sustained and progressively impactful journey all begin? He was born in Cowley, where the father and mother lived in Cowley, just about uh, 200 meters or 150 meters from where I stand. But behind me here is where the national chief imam was raised from cradle. This is where he lived with the mother. So I lead you to the house and I point you to the room that they lived in before he left here. Over there is where the room that his eminence, the national chief imam was raised. That's the room he lived with his mother till the age of about eight when he started schooling and he was taken to old Fadama. Islam is one of the major religions practiced widely in Ghana. Its presence in Ghana dates back to the 10th century. The mainstream Sunni community, made up of the Tijaniya and Al Sunnah, make up approximately 80% of the Muslim population, as against the Ahmadiyya and Shia community, constituting about 20% of the population. These different sects live together and worship peacefully under the leadership of the Grand Mufti. Prior to, most of them even thought that Ahmadiyyat was against Islam, and some of them believed that Ahmadiyyat has been planted by Israel with the backing of the United States of America to infiltrate the ranks of Muslims and undo Islam for and on behalf of the Zionists. Prior to him, like I said, al Sunnah man had nothing doing with a Shiite. A Shiite had nothing doing with uh, uh, a Tijani. Tijani, on the other hand, had nothing doing with Ahl Sunnah and a Shiite. And the, the three of them combined had nothing doing with an Ahmadi Muslim. The Ahmadi Muslim was ostracized kind of on one side. The others were the lesser evil. And to them, the Ahmadis were the major evil. But what do we do and what do we see since the national chief imam came on board as the national chief imam? He has been the type who reaches out. He's been the type who is all embracing. He's been the type who is fatherly. And he's been the type who has become an umbrella. Ghana's great airs tonight. That's all live on Joy News today with me, Daniel Daze. Coming up in business, customers of Gold Coast Fund Management reject government's repayment plan. Daryl Kwao has those details after this. Hi, good afternoon and welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwa. The Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of Ghana has kept the policy rate and change. It left the rate at which it lends to commercial banks at 14.5%. This is about the fourth time since March this year that the Bank of Ghana has kept its lending rate unchanged. Now, the central bank governor, Dr. Ernest Addison, you see in your shots, uh, has been addressing a news conference. He says there are still some risks on the fiscal front, hence the need to hold the rate, um, yeah, we will bring you an update in subsequent bulletins uh, about what he's been saying at that press conference too. 
Now, a group of customers of Gold Coast Fund Management, now Black Shield, have rejected government's new repayment plan for their locked-up funds. The group says the new arrangement is unfavorable and a disadvantage to those with locked-up funds beyond 1 million cities. Prince Apia has more in this report. For more than two years, customers of defunct fund management companies have had challenges accessing their funds. Government has announced payment of the locked up funds, but with 50,000 CD cap. But aggrieved customers say the new payment processes are too cumbersome and will disadvantage its members. Yes, spokesperson Charles Nyame says the payment processes have been rejected. According to the Security Selection Commission, they are released on the 18th. When you receive the test message as a Gold Coast Fund Management customer, you, it will come with a claim ID. And you have to log on to the internet to fill a form with this claim ID. After you fill the form and submit it, you come back home and wait for five working days. After the five working days, you receive a feedback. You take the feedback to commercial bank. Then you fill another form and wait for five working days again. After that, you get a feedback. You take the feedback to the bank again. After that, you come home and wait for two working days. Then you go and check if the money is in the account before you can withdraw. We have already taken our entrained position. We have made the government aware, the Kufuado government aware, that any payment plan that spans after the 7th December, the election day, we do not accept. Leadership wants government to review its payment processes to capture those whose funds exceed 50,000 Ghana cities. Mr. Nyame says government should at least pay 70% of funds exceeding 1 million cities. We accept the capped amount because we know that majority of the customers fall within it fine. But yesterday we are standing as a family. We are pleading with another government that they should go back to the drawing board and find a proper way to meet this category of customers, either by 50% or 70% or 80%. But the capped amount wouldn't help. The group suspects the new patriotic party is patronizing them for politics political expediency. Mr. Nyame says they will not agree to any arrangement that will go beyond December 7. We believe that they just want to span the payment process to be after the election, to lure us to vote for them. After we voted for them, then they will come back to tell us that uh, the, the court cases must, must, must finish before they pay us. We will not do that. What we are saying is that if we are not paid before 7 December, if we don't get our money, as Gold Coast customers nationwide, we will vote against the Kufuado government. Prince Apia, reporting. Well, finally, it would interest you to know that each Ghanaian could be owing about 9,126 Ghana cities. That's if the total debt stock of 273.8 billion cities is shared among a population size of 30 million. The country added 10.7 billion cities in the months of August and September to the public debt, increasing its debt to gross domestic product ratio of about 71 percent. Now, the scenario is that the nation may have to fall on taxes to clear these debts. It's estimated that the value of the Ghanaian economy in monetary terms may be more than 400 billion cities. And we'll have more coming up on the marketplace at the top of the hour. Sports is up next with Ure Kwampofu. Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the sports segment with me, Ure Kwampofu. Well, the trending issue, all the news just coming in from this morning is that CAF, that's the Confederations of African Football President Ahmad Ahmad, has been banned by FIFA for five years. So what that essentially means is that it looks very unlikely that he would be running for next year's elections, which would be happening in March. Now, the details are from an investigation that was taking place from 2017 to 2019, and uh, there were a lot of violations of uh, FIFA's code of ethics, uh, you know, ranging from governance issues throughout to financial issues. But we do have more details for you on our website, my journal online for Slat uh, Sports, and that is the leading story. So you can get details on that as well. But the big story is that he's been banned for five years now.
Well, we would be doing a full discussion on Ahmad Ahmad and what that means for him and then possibly the CAF elections much later today at 4.30 when sports today comes your way. Uh, but let's now uh, move away from this and talk about the Ghana Premier League where we've seen our first managerial casualty and it was the name uh, Goran Baratarovic, who's the coach or who was the coach of Legon City. And joining us via Zoom is uh, the head of communications for Legon City, Kwame Jumo. And we'll be speaking to him about the news. Uh, we've not seen any official club statement, uh, but we just want to find out uh, wh where did the club stands in terms of this. Hi, Kwame Jumo, how are you doing? Very cool, I'm well. And you? I'm doing very well too. Now, from Friday up until today, you know, after that bad result against Olympics, uh, we've seen a lot of news circulating uh, that Goran Baratarevich has been uh, fired from the club. Is this something that you can confirm or is this something that is uh, currently being processed? Well, as I speak to you at this point, the club has not taken a decision on the future of Goran Baratarevich. So at this point, he's still our head coach. Okay, but Kwame Jumo, if... Uh, Judging from what we saw today earlier at your, your platform that we're looking at finishing uh, quite high in the Ghana Premier League, we're looking at uh, anywhere between the first and fourth on the, uh, on the balance of the investment that we had made into the team. So I can understand that fans will want to see the team performing from a very early stage. But it's only the second match of the season, like you did say. There are 32 more games to play, and I'm pretty confident that we'll turn the tide around. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kwame, for spending time with us uh, to clear the air about what's happening with Legon Cities and then, you know, Garan Baratarevich, who has been making rounds about being sacked as Legon Cities coach. Well, we'll be providing you an update on this story much later in the day and as and when they do come in, you can follow our social media at GH. Uh, but we do have world news for you up next. <music> Good afternoon. Welcome to Showbiz here on Joy News today. Now, Stoneboy says he did not expect Sarkodie to report him to the police after his misunderstanding with his manager, Angel Town, at the Black Love concert. According to him, he had sorted his differences with the manager. Thus, he was disappointed to receive a call from the police after resolving the issue. I mean, and people will say, yeah, but why did you go and slap? Come on, man, I didn't assault anybody, bro. Did you pull a gun? Which is, which is the most awkward of it. And at the police station, a witness statement by interrogation was given in account of a gun. And by the CID, they said, did you see? Or you're just coming to say what you think you're saying. And he said, no, no, I didn't see. You see, so... This tells me that it's deeper than that because who, that eyewitness who is going to put in that case is going to build more case on top of the complainant's case, who must definitely be coming from the complainant's side. So me, all I can say is that I went through a lot that time, but it's taught me a lot. I've seen a lot, you know, and henceforth I can only be very, very careful about how I deal with our fellow brothers and sisters in the industry. That's so what is, I've is, is the case yeah. still in, in, in is, is it still with the police? Uh, no, it's been calmly withdrawn. Uh, big respect to Angel, who I'm still very cool with. Oh, really? That's nice. I believe so, because, I mean, we don't talk every day, interact every day, but me, once I follow you and once I, I, I watch your, your snaps, then you should know that we are on there. But I think Angel and I are cool. Because if there was any case at all, it was an altercation between him and I. And unfortunately, um, there was a notion that I hit his eye or I broke his eye. But God being so good, I, his eye didn't go blind, whatever. And there were no cuts as well, as well and all. So did you and, see? And did you see a picture of him with with a with a, a plaster? Yes, I, I saw that after a few days after you know, and. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. I'm grateful that it didn't go worse because two, three days after he was 